Uh, good morning, everybody. All right, so we're going to be continuing into a, in a, the book of Ephesians. And so we're going to be talking about the mystery of Christ. And so the verses are there on the handout. They'll be up on the screen. We're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And so you can read it with me. It says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So when you guys see this word mystery, do you guys know what that means? Do you know what the mystery of Christ is? Or are you kind of like, I'm wondering about it as well? Right. Does anybody like mystery? You guys like mysteries, crime, like, you know, movies and stuff like where they're solving stuff. Right. I love that kind of stuff. I love to solve everything. Right? I'm a big guy. I'm a very curious person. I've always been that in my life. Right? So I was, I was glad to see this uh, verse right for me to preach it, because I understand, like, once you see a mystery or once you don't know, usually you'll do everything you can to know it. Right. You won't settle until you actually solve the mystery. And so for a lot of us, you know, especially for the, the people back then. They had a mystery of why Christ did what he did. What was this supposed to really mean? Why was he doing it? And so Paul is telling them, you need to solve this mystery. You need to understand why it was done. And that applies to all of us still today. If we do not know, if, the, if Christ is still a mystery to us and all his actions and God's plan, then why are we doing everything we can to solve that mystery? Right? We should be saying, I want to know. because uh, So thankfully, Jesus makes it easier for us. He's going to show us what this really means. And Paul's going to break that down for us. Right. But really, right, once there's a mystery, you don't stop until you get the answer. Right. So for me as a kid, I was very curious. Um, I, I, I would hear all these stories. Right. Like my, I would break apart all the, tech, the technology in the house. Right? When they got a new VCR, DVD player, all that stuff, I'd always take it apart to see how it worked. Right. So my parents were always mad about that. Right. Because I was <laughs> taking apart everything. Uh, but that's what I was. I wanted to know. I was talking to my parents this week because I wanted to know before I prepped this message. Like, was there any other things that I had to know about? And so they had tons. They're like, "Woo!" Like, boy, do we have stories, right? So apparently, when I was like three years old, we went to the on the uh, the ferry in San Francisco. Like, you know, you do the boat ride. So when I was on the ferry, that was my first time on. I'm like, "Oh, this is nice." But then I looked at the ocean. I was like, "Oh, I want to know what that's about." So I tried to jump off the ferry into the ocean, right, to learn. <laughs> so luckily, my my uh, we went with my mom's friend. She had a, a a daughter that was older than us, so she was the one watching us, right? So she was she was able to stop me from jumping over the the, the boat. But my parents warned her, like, every time, like, don't take your eyes off him, right? Like, you have to watch him 24-7 every second. Otherwise, he'll just go off and do his own thing. And she's like, no, nah, he won't do that. But every time she would look away or look at something, check, you know, uh, check her uh, purse or something, I would be trying to jump over the ledge, right, trying to see what the ocean was like. And so I didn't get to see the ocean, what it was like. So the next time, a couple months later, we went to Santa Cruz to the beach. And they told her the same thing. Don't leave Joaquin for a second. Right? Like, you can't let him go on his own. And so she's like, no, nah, he's so quiet. He's so well-behaved. Right, like he's not gonna do anything wrong, and I was always quiet so that nobody would watch me, that I could do whatever I wanted. Right, like that's how I was as a kid. So I, I was, see, I was at the Santa Cruz beach watching the ocean. I'm like, I want to get in the ocean. So as soon as she went to look in her purse, I just took off and went into the ocean. Right. <laughs> so next thing you know, I'm floating away, and so luckily this girl was a lifeguard. Right. So she went and swam and saved me and uh, brought me back to life right on the beach. But that's what they, you know, they realized. Like, man, Joaquin is nonstop. Like he, he's so curious, he just will go no matter what, no matter how dangerous it is. Right. So we talk about like curiosity kills the cat. Apparently, curiosity cannot kill baby Joaquin. Right. And so but thankfully, that's who God made me. Right. I've always been curious. I've always wanted to know. And so when I see Christ coming to the cross, doing all these things, when I first read that, I'm always like, what did that? What is that? Why did God do that? Why does that have to happen? Right. What is what are we supposed to know from Jesus going to the cross? Especially when they talk about there's a mystery behind why we don't understand it. And the, the first point is that God desired to be one with us, right? Jesus going to the cross is not the full plan that God has. That is part of it. That is the middle of it. We're not taking anything away from the cross, but that is an action, not the, the full plan and dream, right? God's desire was to be one with us, to have relationship with us. Sin cost us that relationship. We had to go away. So, but God had a plan to bring us back by Jesus going to the cross. See how that's in the middle? 
right? The cross is in the middle. It's an action based upon what we've done. But God's desire was always to be one with us. That was, that's the mystery that Jesus is trying to show us. I'm willing to come down and be your sacrifice to restore what God has always wanted, to restore what our Father has always wanted, and that is to be one with you, to be one family. So the, and so that's where we see, like, God's desire to be made one with us. This is throughout all the Old Testament, right? God made the Garden of Eden to meet with us. He's there with Adam and Eve. He's, it's right there for them so that they can be together in fellowship. We see God talk to Abraham over and over again. God calls him his friend. He says he's a friend of God. The reason why we know he's his friend is because God shared everything with Abraham. He shared all his plans. He talked them out with him like a true friend. We see God actually being one with Abraham. This is why he's the father of faith. But we get to see what God truly desired. I'm one with my child. I'm one with my son, Abraham. I want that for all the future generations, right? He's, that's what we see. He spoke directly to his people. He talked to Moses, right? When they were slaves, all these things. He's like, I'm going to bring them out. I care about them. I hear their cries. I'm going to bring them to me. I'm going to bring them out of uh, bondage and bring them straight to me. When God brought them out of Egypt, he takes them to the mountain where he met and talked to Moses with the burning bush. If you guys ever read Exodus, when they get to that mountain, God said, Moses, bring everybody to the top of the mountain to be with God. He was like, bring them all. So they were like, there's three days we're going to meet. I want them to prepare themselves, cleanse, you know, do all the rituals of cleaning and stuff like that. We're all going to meet on the mountaintop. So as these three days were going on, there was all these crazy clouds coming, right? Like it just looked like a wild scene. So people got, started getting scared. They're like, oh, man, like we can't go in front of God. We can't be in his presence. We're not worthy enough. We're not good enough. Right? We're scared. So they tell Moses, you go for us. You talk to God and be within his presence. We're too afraid to go. So we see God's desire was for all of them to go on the mountain, but they wouldn't meet him there. And so only Moses would go. But we can see God's desire all along. He wanted to bring them out of Egypt and be one with every single one of them. And that's where in that story, Moses is on the mountain. He's there for a long time. They start panicking. That's when they create the golden calf. That's where, why you see God's anger after they made that. Because God had just invited them to be with him 100%. And they were too afraid, but yet then all of a sudden they made a, a false idol. See how that worked? And that's where God was like, that's it. None of you, you there's, there was a punishment for those that did that. Right? But, that's, but we can always see God's heart, his plan, his desire to be one with them. After that episode, right, he would, be their, he would leave their, their empire, their nation. They were a theocracy. Right? Then they would become a monarchy because they wanted a king that would help them give more direct answers. God warns them, why do you want a king? I can do so much more for you. I can do things. I won't take things from you the way a king will. Let me warn you before you, want, before you make this choice. They still made that choice. They rejected God. But here we see. Right? God was trying to always be with them, always trying to lead them. They're the ones that wanted to be set free. And so as they did that, they faced a lot of consequences. They, went, um, they ended up getting sent away. But through, after that time, God always promised that I'm going to make a heart, I'm going to make a home in their hearts. Right? If you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all these guys, God promised over and over again, one day I will make my home in their hearts. I was only in, at home in the ark of a... In a, in a at a, in the temple, but I'm going to be with them every, every single one of them. And he even promises back in the Old Testament, even all the Gentile nations, I will be a part of them. Every one of them. So we can see for thousands of years, this is what God's desire and plan was. I want to be one with my people. And the question was going to be, how would that be achieved? And that's where we see Jesus saying, I will pay the price for all their sins. I will pay the price so that they can now have the Holy Spirit inside them. That we're, we're going to work this plan that God has had all along. This is the action step that God's going to do. And so the mystery that Jesus is showing them, because it's like, oh, yeah, it's nice that God wants to make a home in us, but what will he do to make that happen? And this is the second point. God would do anything to restore our relationship. This is what Jesus is supposed to show us. God was willing to do anything. He would withhold nothing. He would give his only son 
to ensure that we could be restored in, in our rightful place. You would see um, in a lot of the New Testament, this is over and over again. Uh, God shared that he wants all people to be saved. It's, um, in 2 Peter, this is 3, 8 through 9. This is where it talks about one day is like a thousand days to God. A thousand days is like one day to him. The reason why he's slow to move, the reason why he's patient is because he wants all to be saved. He doesn't want to bring the end times right away and cut off people from being saved. He was willing to wait. He's willing to take the punishment. He's willing to take the suffering being caused by his people running away from him. As long as it takes, if it means the most people will be saved. Right? God would do anything to restore our relationship, even waiting and letting us keep hurting him. The fact that God would do anything shows he does not want to punish and condemn. This is what John 3, 16, 17 is all about. He says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. He does not wish for anyone to perish. So many times people think God's always eager to punish. He's got so much wrath, all these other things, right? Of course, he doesn't want to bring us to him. We've done so much to draw, draw us away. And yet here, God keeps saying it over and over again. Jesus is meant to show them. He does not want to condemn and punish. Will he punish? Of course he will. But he punishes in a way to make sure it points you to repentance and you following God. Because that's the only way you'll be saved. Right? So even his punishment is always meant to save people. That's what he desires the most. And he'll do anything to make that happen. That's what Paul wrote again in Romans. Right? He was willing to give up his son to restore us. When he's telling us why, we're, why should we should be so confident that we'll never go away from God once we've accepted him, he literally says, what else can he give? He's literally given up his only son to ensure that we're with him. That should give you the security that there is no way he'll let you go. He, he, with, he, did, he withheld nothing. And this is where, you know, he withheld nothing to his dream, to achieve his dream to be with us all. This was kind of the whole Jeremiah text, right? God, uh, for, he, for he wants good for us to prosper. That's his plans all along. I know, I, I know the plans I have for you. For you to have good and prosper. God has said this over and over again. Because when he says, when Israel got taken away, they get, become exiles. He says, one day you'll be restored. You'll be back to your home. And in that day, I will make my home in your hearts. For I know the plans I have for you for good and to prosper. Right? God has said this over and over again. I will do anything to restore our relationship. And so that's what Christ is supposed to be showing us. And so as we do that, as we know this, do you really believe that? Do you believe God would do anything to save you? Right? Or do you think, no, nah, I'm not worth it. Or no, nah, you know, he could find better people. Or no, nah, I'm going to keep making mistakes. Or, is, you know, it's not worth it. When I, when I read this, right, when I, when, I, when I think about how, when I learned that God would do anything to save me, I learned this from my parents. I learned when they, through a very tough season in my life, they did not give up on me. They loved me through everything, and they would do anything to make sure I was safe, right? Um, so when I was prepping this, this is the story that came to my mind, right? When I was in eighth grade, I ran away from home. Right? I ran away during Christmas break. I left for home for like two weeks. So if you, if the reason why I left is because my dad, if you know who my dad is, he's very strict, very firm, right? He is a guy that's like, you either follow my rules or you leave. Right. He's like he's like he gives you three options. You can follow my rules. You can leave or you can fight me and take over the family. Your choice. Right? And he's like, if you want to fight me, you better make sure you finish me off. Right. He's like, Because I'm going to take you. Like, and so that that was his mindset. Like, you, you know, that was who he is. He's, he's funny like that. But at the same time, dude's one of the toughest dudes you'll ever meet. Right. But that's how he led. Because uh, for him, that's how he always saw God. Right. God gave people the option. You can follow me or leave. It's up to you. If you want to leave, know what's going to happen to you when you leave. Know what the life will have. Why would you not want to stay with me? So much better. So that's how my dad raised his kids. So when I was in eighth grade, my older brother was a senior. He was 18, and my sister was a sophomore. So my dad was using this teaching and philosophy with my older sibling, right? So at first, my brother was 18. You know, he was trying to do all these things and rebel. My dad's like, you got one choice, right? You either follow me or leave. Go, go provide for yourself. Go do everything you want. My brother was too scared to go out on his own, right? He was like, no, I know I can't provide for myself the way my dad is. Right. So he was like, I'm willing to follow my dad's rules and I'll, I'll just cave. 
So when he did this, my brother, my, they worked for my older brother. Then my older sister, when she saw my older brother doing all that other stuff, right, that he was doing, she's like, I want to do it too. Like, how come I can't do this? How come I can't do that? God, you know, dad, you're, you're not fair. And he's like, you got two choices, right? Follow me or leave. So my sister, you know, she was a sophomore. She's like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to challenge him, right? I'm not, I'm just going to follow what he says. So he, she came under his teaching. So here I am, eighth grade. I was having some issues with my mom at work. And so I was trying to talk to my dad, like, hey, you know, at the, at the shop, you know, can we do this? Can we change that? Can I go to your shop? Right? And so I was like, God, you got to do something, pa. And so uh, as he's saying this, he's like, first of all, you're my son. You ain't telling me what to do, right? Like, this is my business. You got And so he's like, you have two choices, Joaquin. You can either follow my rules or leave. I was like, okay. So he, I went home, right? He sent me home for the day from, from work. So I packed up my stuff and I left. Right? And so I was like, he said I could leave. So I left for, uh, during Christmas break two weeks. So during this time, it was super cold, right? It was the coldest time of the year. Uh, every morning when, when it would come, like, it would be like snow on the ground, right? Like everything would be iced over in snow. And so as I'm out here on the street, you know, my dad, you know, he taught me how to survive, right? Uh, he, my whole childhood was a uh, preparation for the army. Like everything I did, he was always teaching me. So I learned a little bit of survival skills. And so one of the things I, know, I knew was that the wind was what was, was, makes it the worst, right? So I was like, if I can just find shelter from the wind, I can survive these nights. And so my plan, and I was like, I also have to stay safe because I'm a kid, or I can't just sleep on the street. So I came up with this plan that I, I knew all these houses had these tree houses in the backyard. And so I was like, because it's so cold, nobody's going to be out in their tree houses, right? Everybody's going to be inside bundled up. So I was like, at night, I can just sneak into these tree houses and sleep. And so every night, as soon as it got dark, I would jump, I'd jump people's fences and, and sleep in their tree houses, right? So I, I was able to survive this cold winter for two weeks. And so uh, after, the, after the two weeks were up, Christmas break was over. In my mind, I was like, hey, I'm going to make sure I get an education. I'm going to take care of my life, right? I'm going to be a responsible person. I'm going to go to school as soon as it comes back in session. So when I showed up to school, guess who was waiting for me? My parents and the cops, right? <laughs> so when you run away, it's a crime, right? They're gonna, uh... So my parents there, I had to do this meeting with my parents, the principal, and the cop. And so as, we, as we're talking, right, the cop's like, you know, it's illegal to run away and all this stuff. I was like, I didn't run away. My dad gave me the option to leave. He said, it's my choice, <laughs> right? And so the cop's like, what? No parent would say that. I was like, ask him if he said it. And so he asked, the cop asked my dad, did you tell him he could leave? He's like, yeah, technically. So my, the cop's kind of shocked, right? So I was like, yeah, I guess we can't punish him for running away. Like, that, he didn't technically break your rules, right? So then he was like, well, you got to tell us where you stayed at. Whoever harbored you as a, as a child, as a fugitive, that's breaking the law. So you need to tell us. I was like, I'm not telling you nothing. And he was like, if you don't tell me, I'm going to arrest you for obstruction of justice. You're not telling me this. And so I was, like, I was like, first of all, I was like, I slept on the street. Nobody helped me. I did it on my own. So the cop didn't believe me. He's like, no way. It was way too cold for anybody to survive. Like, I don't believe you. I was like, well, believe it. I stayed on the street. And he was like, how, how, how can we know? And I was like, my dad taught me that if anybody could take something away from you, right, if you're weak and they can, and they can expose that area, then they can force you to do whatever you want. So in those times, you got to dig down deep, find the passion, and find the, the will to, to withstand whatever you're going through to make sure you can do whatever you want. So I was like, so when I was freezing at night, in my heart, I was just fueled by the passion <laughs> that I was not going to do what somebody told me to do. And I was like, the only way I could ensure that that happens is if I can withstand this cold. And so I, in my heart, I just kept that hate and uh, anger in my side, and I stayed warm all night. Right? So the cops looked at me like, what the heck? And my dad looked at me eye to eye, and I looked at him and was like, you know it's right. And he was like, eh? like, he's like, all right. And he's like, yeah, don't stop asking him. Right? I believe him. And so he was like, this kid's crazy. Right? He's like, but he's like, but damn, he just followed my teaching to, to the letter, right? Like, he's kind of impressed. But I was like, damn, this guy actually listened. But, but he knew, right? He knew that that's, that was my, my motivating uh, factor. So when we got home, obviously, my parents were kind of getting on me, right, trying to correct me. And so as we're sitting there at the table, my dad was kind of telling me, like, you can't just break the rules. You can't just do whatever you want. He's like, you can't just take off. You know, he's like, you can't break, you know, these rules, right? He's like, you got to have honor and integrity. I was like, what are you talking about honor and integrity? He's like, you're the liar. Right. So when I said this, I jumped, I jumped up and I kind of bumped the table at him, right? Like a passive aggressive push. So I was like, I was like, you're the liar. He's like, what? So now he stands up, pushes the table back at me, right? Like, what are you calling a liar? I was like, you said you would never come and get us, that it was our choice, and you said I could leave. The fact that you came to get me shows you're a liar. And he's just like, oh, and like, I was like, you have no honor and integrity, right? My dad's like, oh, well, I'm gonna hit this. Right. So as soon as he looked up, he's kind of like, hmm. All right. So he stopped. He's like, you're right. He's like, yeah, I lied. I said you could leave. I said I wouldn't get you if you ever leave. He's like, but I can't live that. I can't fulfill that word. And he was like, he's like, yes, you can survive on the street on your own. You've proven that. You can do whatever it takes uh, to just get by. 
But that's not the life you're meant to have. That's not the best life you could possibly live if you go down that path. As a parent, it's my job to help you have the best life possible. It's my job to ensure that you get to do what God made you to do. If I don't, if I don't come for you now, you'll never do what God made you, God made you to do. Right? So he's like, so I have to be willing to break my promise to you and do what's best for you. Right? So when he said that, I just instantly sat down, right? I was like, oh man, like I didn't think about it that way. Right? I didn't think, I was like, I was just always thinking about his rules, right? I was just thinking about his way versus my way. But then that's when I really understood what a parent's love was, what grace was, where it was like, I was made my life, I made my parents' life miserable for so many years, right? Always breaking rules, always challenging them, where it was like, it would have been easy for them to let me go, right? It would have been so much easier on their lives that they just said like, you know what, Joaquin don't want us, then fine, our lives are going to be easier. But they didn't do that, right? They're like, we know what's best for him, and we got to do whatever it takes to make sure he knows what's right. Even if that means bringing a, a rebellious child back, all right? Like, that's what we got to do. And they were willing to do it. So when I saw my parents with that willingness to, to, to still be there for me, it changed my whole life, right? It made me understand what I'd read about God over and over again. Because I read all the Bible throughout my childhood. Every time I got punished, they made me read the Bible. So basically, from that age, I already read the Bible three times completely, right? Because <laughs> I was always in trouble. Uh, but, that, but when I read the stories of the prodigal son or God doing all this other stuff, it, didn't, it never clicked in my mind. Does that make sense? It was always like, who would do that? Why would you do that? Who would love somebody even though they reject them? Who would love somebody even though they hurt them over and over again? That doesn't make sense. But when I saw my parents being willing to do it, it just magically, everything made sense about God. Because that's what they said. The reason why we have the strength to be your parents, Joaquin, is only because of God. Right? The only way we're able to do all these things was because of God, how he's a parent to us. Right? When we, all these times you've been in trouble, we always just pray to him, asking for guidance, trying to be more like him. And that's what they'd always tell me over and over again. Now it finally hit, where it's like, this is what it looks like. This is what true parental love looks like. They would do anything. And so when I saw that, that's what made me understand God that much more. He would do anything to restore our relationship. And the reason why is because we're his. He, we are his one and only children. Right? He made us to be just like him. And so that's where, like, this mystery of why Christ, why he would send, why we would send Christ down. Why do we have this opportunity to get back? Because that's what parents do. They want their children more than anything. Right? That's what God wants. He would do anything to restore them. And so as we know this, as we really understand that God did this, there's an action that we're supposed to now do because of that. We're supposed to want to get close to our Father. Right? So the third point is Jesus is the reason we can be close to our Heavenly Father again. When Paul is writing this to this group, right, he's going to talk to them. God gave everything to have you close to him. Jesus gave everything for you to be able to be close to your Father. Do everything you can to take advantage of that opportunity you were now given. They paid the heaviest of price to ensure you could be with them. He was reminding them, because like, you know, that's what the next couple chapters are about how to walk in the spirit, how to be unified, how to do all these things to actually be children of God. Because that's what is meant to be. That was God's plan all along. The mystery of Christ shows us where we were supposed to be all along. And so Jesus is the reason we can be close to our Heavenly Father again. I have the text up here, John 15, right? 13 through 16. It's there on the handout. It says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. Right here we continue. We are now made to be friends with God. We're not his servants. Right? It tells you. You servant, you don't tell them your plan. You just tell them what to do. Right? You just tell them, hey, go buy this stuff. Go clean that up. But a, a friend, you're like, hey, we're going we're gonna to co-cook this. Let's have a meal together. Right? You do all these other things. Jesus literally tells us, oh, 
We are revealing everything to you. You only do that for a friend. You're not just servants to God. You're not just his slave. You are one with him. You are his friend. Just like the characters of old, Abraham, David, all these people, they said, these are my friends. I'm close to them. I talk to them. I share things with them. Right? This is what Jesus died for, to you, for you to be God's friend. Most of us can, will just settle to be his servant. As long as he tells me what to do, I'm good. But it's more than that. There's way more that we're offered. That's why I shared that story about the Israelites. Right? They didn't want to go up to be in front of God. They're like, Moses, you just talk to God for us and then tell us what he wants us to do. That path does not lead to them being closer. That path does not lead to them being more faithful. God knows that to, to really be who we're supposed to be, we got to be as close as can be, to be true friends. That's what Jesus died for. I want you to be friends with, my, with our Father. I want you to be as close to him as I am to him. That's why I'm making known to you everything that he tells me. So that you can then go to him and do the same thing. That's what God wants. That's what I want for you. I'm willing to pay the price so that you can have that. This is where we see like Jesus broke the veil between us and God, right? This is when we see he goes on the cross when he dies. They, they, talk, they, they tell you the temple, the, the, they had this huge curtain that kept God's presence away from the people. It breaks. Because that's what it's trying to tell you. You will no longer have to have somebody else talk to God for you. You no longer have to have him just in one area. He's going to now be with every one of you. Do you want that? Are you actually going to choose that? Are you going to take advantage of knowing you can be as close to God as possible? And so as we're talking about being close to God, I feel like most of you probably don't know how to get close to God. Right? We're like, it, so it sounds good. We hear it all the time. But it's like, what does it mean to be close? So I got something there to share with you where it talks about how to actually be more intimate with God. So I'm, I'm reading this book. It's called Preventing Ministry Failure. I'm reading a lot of books. Uh, I, like, I read a lot of books on ministry leadership. Right? They have a lot of good material. Uh, but w- one of the things it talks about is like, even for ministers and pastors, sometimes they don't feel close to God. Even though they do a lot of work for God, you do feel like you don't always get close to him. Right? And a lot of it's just because we're doing the work, we're doing the work, we're not actually spending time getting close to God. So this, was, this guy trying to encourage us to find more and more ways to get closer to God. And so it's, it's been helping me. I feel it can help you as well. But basically, this guy says there's, there's five major ways of intimacy is expressed. Spiritual, emotional, intellectual, social, and physical. So most of the time we think of intimacy, you're probably just thinking husband and wife, right? A couple. But intimacy is really about actually sharing everything with somebody, right? Leaning on people, always trusting them, right? And, and uh, wanting the best for each other, right? In reality, friendship is really more about intimacy. You're really intimate with your friends. You're close with them. You, you lean on them. A couple will take it extra, will take it one step further with the physical side, but everything else starts with friendship and the, the intimacy, right? So it's going to help us kind of look at what does it mean to be intimate with God. So we're going to look at each one. The first one is spiritual intimacy. It refers to those things done to participate in and encourage the building up of our personal love relationship with God. Prayer, corporate worship, and spiritual readings or discussions together are all examples of such intimate relating spiritually. When you read that list, is that pretty much all that you do to get closer to God? Right? Prayer, corporate worship, reading the Bible, talking it out. Right? That's only one category. But that's all pretty much we all do. It's what we've been programmed to do. Tradition has shown us just do those things, you'll get closer to God. But let's be honest. If you've been doing those traditions, you probably don't feel that close to God, right? You're always asking, I wish I could get closer and closer. So this is where I said, like, that's only one area. You're only working on your spiritual bond with God when it's only at church, when it's only worship, when it's only reading the Bible. That's just your spiritual growth, right? You can have friends at church, and you're like, hey, let's go meet for lunch. If you only talk about the church and faith, you'd be like, man, that's not enough. I want to talk about my job. I want to talk about my dating. I want to talk about my family, right? You would not be intimate if only you talked about church. You would be good church friends, but you would not be good friends. Right? You, need, you would need more. You need it to cover everything. So the same way, uh, we're supposed to be closer to God. So we're going to look at these other levels. And a lot of these levels, you'll see, there's a lot of scriptures, there's a lot of things that you've seen characters in the Bible live out these ways that they got close to God. This is where we can see, because that's where this guy took it from. All these, all these interactions of God between people, how he got close to them, how they got close to him. So emotional intimacy. 
It grows in proportion to our ability to express our positive and negative feelings with each other. This requires practice and risking vulnerability with one another, but is necessary to experience deeper intimacy of the soul. Why does God say to, bear, to share everything with him, to bear your burdens, to do, do all that stuff, express your doubts, your fears? He's trying to build emotional connection, right? When you pray, most of the time you're asking for something. I want direction. I want this. I want that. That's spiritual direction. That's spiritual closeness. But that's not emotional closeness, right? That's why when you read the Psalms, look at how they talk to God. They're bearing their full hearts to him. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm struggling with. I'm so low right now. Help me. And that's where we see God answer them. He answers their emotional, and they grow closer and closer. That's where, for me, the, the closest I probably got to God is always in those times when I'm like, God, I'm really down right now. I'm really struggling. I'm like, God, I can't believe these people are rejecting me. Right? I'll be, bro I'll be breaking down, and God's like, I understand, Joaquin. I've been rejected so much, too. I hate that feeling. I hate that you got to go through that. But just know you're doing it for me. Just know I'm with you. Right? Draw the strength from Christ when he was rejected. Do all those things, knowing what it's for. Right? So we grow closer emotionally because we're, I'm sharing it with him. And he shares it right back. Does that make sense? It's not just reading his word. It's actually talking about everything on my heart. Because most of us, we always say, like, oh, God knows my heart. I don't have to tell him. That's true. But you, it draws you closer when you actually share, right? When you share with your friends what you're going through, you get closer. If you just have friends that are, like, patting you on the back, like, okay, don't tell me. I just I hope you feel better. You'd be like, man, that guy, that person ain't nothing. You know, that's not a good friend. But the friend that's like, I'll cry with you, you know. <laughs> right? You're like, man, I love this person. Right? That, that's what draws you closer when you actually share everything in Bob. It works that way with God. Do you actually share everything? Do you talk to him that way he can talk back to you? So there's intellectual intimacy. It includes dreaming about and planning for the future. Use of humor with one another making deliberate choices based on how it affects both of you and engaging in stimulating discussion on topics of mutual interest over a lifetime together. We see so many characters. We see God is, they're going through their dreams. They're talking to God, right? You should be able to share everything that you want to do with God. How can you find your, a plan for your life if you don't even tell him what you want or why you want it or what you think you were made to do? Right? When you actually share that, he can share back to you. Wait a minute. The only reason why you're thinking this is because this is what happened to you. You're only thinking this, all this other reason. Right? I, I always laugh that I'm afraid of water. And I, when I heard the stories, I was like, man, I was willing to jump in the ocean. It's because I almost drowned as a baby, right? Like I didn't, I didn't realize that now I'm afraid of water for that reason. But I actually loved water. That makes sense. It was just kind of like the, the trauma that changed me. And so this is where we see, like, there's a, when we share our plans with God, we're growing closer to him. We're also trusting him to also reveal what he thinks is best for us, right? It's because everything that we do, it affects him as well. That's what brought, draws us closer. I was thinking about this for like even Christians, right? Where you, you can be in here like, oh man, I love God's forgiveness, all this other stuff. And then as soon as you go outside, somebody pisses you off and you're like, I hate you, you're going to hell. Like you're the worst person ever, right? You'll never be forgiven. <laughs> if you go off on them, right? That affects God because everyone's gonna be like, this person just came out of church and they're just, they have so much hate in their heart. Right? I don't, this God ain't real. This change ain't real. Forgiveness ain't real to them. You see what I'm saying? Your choices affect what happens to, your, to God. So that's why, that's why we end up checking with God. That's what it's over and over again. Before you act, before you start reacting, check with God real quick. Because what you're going to do is actually going to affect them. When you're close to him, you will now live a different life. That's what we see in the rest of Ephesians. He talks about when you walk in the spirit, you're living in ways that know that you know everything you do affects God. That it says that's when you know you're close. When every choice you make, like, how is God going to react to this? Okay? That's what it means to be close. Because uh, even for me, my, right, through that story that I shared, going through that, I ended up getting closer to my parents over time. And so I, I, I was really there for them uh, because of that, right? And so um, this understanding of you now make choices on how it affects both of you. I shared with you guys when I went to the uh, Army, my mom had cancer, right? So when I went, to, when I left for the army, I gave my dad my checkbook, and I was like, "Whenever you need help for the medical bills, you know, I'm gonna be off in training, all that stuff. I don't, I can't spend any of the money." So I was like, "Write yourself checks whenever you need it. Whenever you need to pay mom's stuff, her bills or medication, use that money whenever you want." Right. And so I was like, "Just sign the checks." And so he was like, "How am I gonna sign your check?" Right. Like the the bank's gonna know it's a forgery. And so I was like, "Well, let me see your signature. Let me show you mine." 
So I showed her my signature. She's like, why does your signature just look, just look, looks just like mine? And I was like, I forged your signature so many times. <laughs> Our signature <laughs> looks the same. <laughs> Why I forged it, I'll tell you that later. But basically, the only difference between our signatures was mine was with a J, his was an F. Everything else was identical. So it was very easy for my dad to sign these checks. I knew that. That's why I did it ahead of time. I knew one day he would need my checkbook. Uh, <laughs> so basically, like, my dad would do this, right, for a good uh, two years. So they took probably about 15000 uh, maybe twenty. So when it, when it came time for me to go to Iraq, right, now I was like, I won't really be able to communicate with you. So I was like, you need to be able to have this and, and take care of it. And so the day before I left to go to Iraq, I was with my parents, and my mom was worried, right? And she was like, tell him, tell him. And so she was like, tell Joaquin. And so I was like, what's up? And so my dad was like, yeah, we're really close to losing the house. And so, um, and as you were telling me that, I was like, well, you have the checkbook, right? I still have plenty of money in the savings. And he's like, well, I don't want to take any more. And so that's what my mom told him. Like, he doesn't want to take any more of your money. And so as he said that, he's like, you know why, Joaquin and I. And when my dad told me when he went to Vietnam, Right, you make a lot of money, it's all saved up because you can never spend it. So when you get home, you always have a nice little nest egg. He's like, when I was, when I was gone, I did the same thing for my family. I gave them, the, I gave them the, the, the bank access. You know, they could always, so I gave it to my parents. Like, hey, if you guys ever need anything, ever emergency, you can use that money. Right, so his mom, his mom used all that money to spoil the firstborn child. Oh, he needed a better car. He needed this. He needed that. Right, the younger siblings, you guys know this life. All right, <laughs> but basically.